the beauty of a life group is that you get a chance to create some connection and int intimacy with other members of that life group. We're doing some remodeling of our new house and um, we bought a bunch of flooring, vinyl flooring, and we started to, you know, look at it and see how to do it. And we got real stressed out. And so uh, Crystal called Sean and was, at, was gonna ask him if he, for some advice or if they had time to maybe help. Well, when she called him, they were actually sitting in our driveway. So we started Friday, late Friday, and then we, uh, Saturday we laid flooring all day and into the night. Uh, Sunday, uh, we, after church, we, we came back over there and then Sean and Kim came back on Sunday and you know, we were supposed to have a life group that night. Kim came in and said that one had said that they would come over and that John Mark had spoke that morning about life group and how it wasn't just about getting together and fellowship in that way. John Mark had, had preached that morning on Jesus' body composition and why it's not enough to just attend and that was his challenge that morning was take action, be uncomfortable, and do something. So that afternoon when we had heard from the capers, uh, from Crystal and Jason, that they weren't gonna be able to make it and Sean and Kim were already there helping, uh, it really, John Mark's words kinda came to mind and think, well, I guess this is our opportunity to really step up and, and uh, help. Oh man, we were, it was very such a humbled. blessing. Uh, very, very humbled. Uh, that's a perfect example of it because you drop what you're doing and go help your family if they need you. Scott says on a regular basis, you need to spend daily time in the Word, weekly time with other believers. When you surround yourself with those in the like-mindedness and in the, in the love, it brings God out more. And that's what they did for us. When I see people in the church, people that I don't know that I've met for the first time, I usually ask them, are you in a life group? And, and I usually let them know, if you're not, you need to be. There's just so much more into some I intimacy when you're in a life group. When you have that connection with other, other members of the church, uh, there's longevity there, there's a connection. And I think that's where the authenticity is. It's not any different than a normal family. You get along great, you get together, you, we have meals together, we spend time together, and at the same time, there's times that we disagree, um, but a disagreement doesn't mean there's separation there. It's grown into a family that you never thought would be, and they are. It's more than what the church used to be for me. They really are family, you know, to us. Well, that's my life group, by the way. Phyllis and I uh, are active in the, we call it the 222 life group, the 222. It stands for 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. Uh, where Paul writes the things that you have, you know, heard, learned from us, and, you know, entrust them to other reliable individuals. The idea is that the gospel continues to move, continues to spread, continues to grow, continues to impact the world. Juan Cadena is my life group leader, uh, Phyllis's life group leader. We meet Sunday nights at uh, 5.30. Not tonight, because we're going to be here eating uh, Tex-Mex and throwing burritos or something like that, I, if I understood what Gene was talking about. Uh, but we'll be here tonight, and then our life group will resume meeting next um, Sunday evening. You're more than welcome to join us. Uh, see Juan Cadena. There he is, back there in the corner, Juan Cadena, uh, or Annette Cadena, who's probably over in the nursery today. Yeah, uh, see them, and they can help you get hooked up with our life group. As it's been mentioned, we're starting a brand new series. It's a church-wide series that focuses on four 
uh, primary values of our church, four core values that make Allsbury what Allsbury is. And we've identified those. We express them as the ABCs of ABC, ABCS, ABCs of ABC. And the A, which we're focusing on today, is authentic family. The B is biblical practice. The C is compassionate reach. And the S is a spirit empowered. We're going to be sharing testimonies like you saw today with uh, Crystal and Jason and then uh, Juan Cadena included in that. Uh, those testimonies from a variety of different angles based on these ABCs of ABC. We're going to share testimonies. We're going to uh, hear a message on a Sunday morning, and then we will have an immediate practical application of what we're talking about. Thus, you know, tonight we're coming together as a family, sharing a meal together, laughing together, um, uh, spending a little life together. This morning we're dealing with the A, authentic families, or authentic family, us as an individual congregation. And we're going to be looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. We're going to look at the passage in two parts, verses 1 and 2. And then we'll look at uh, verse 3 of chapter 1 with the second part. The word family appears in the uh, New International Version translation of the Bible. Uh, the word family appears over 200 times. The vast majority uh, of the usages are dealing with what we typically think of as family. You know, we think of, um, you know, Moses and his family began to travel, or we think of um, Noah and his family getting the ark, or we think of David, King David and his family, his children and his multiple wives. That's a whole nother story for another day. We think of um, different aspects of the family experience, but there is also the aspect of family as an identification of us, the body of Christ, the people of God, uh, Jesus' bride, the building that he's erecting. The Bible uses multiple metaphors to describe us, the people of God, and one of those is the family of God. Uh, let me read just quickly from Hebrews chapter 2. The writer of Hebrews says, both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. And thinking of that, um, that aspect of Jesus referring to us as brothers and sisters, I think of Luke chapter 8. It's actually a story that's related in uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him. But the crowd was so big, gathered around Jesus, that they were unable to get near him. And so someone spoke to Jesus saying, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are standing outside waiting to see you. Now you can understand what they're, what they're saying. Hey, you know, Mary and your siblings, half brothers, half sisters, they are waiting for you. They want to see you. And so let's make way in the crowd. I know you're going to invite your family in because family kind of trumps all other relationships. But Jesus replied, my brother and my mother are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. Jesus is saying, my family is made up of those who hear the word of God and embrace biblical practices. Kind of a teaser for next Sunday morning as we consider the B of ABCs, biblical practices. But today we're dealing with authentic family. And so let's read the text. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Again, we're going to deal with the the text in two parts, and the first one is verses 1 and 2, uh, where we, we see Paul describing his persistent prayers of gratitude. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. He begins by saying, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, names that we're familiar with, are writing to the church of the Thessalonians, that's uh, the people of a city called Thessalonica in Macedonia, uh, modern-day Turkey. Uh, Paul, Silas, and Timothy writing to these believers in the city of Thessalonica. But I think we all understand that Paul is including those who are with him. This isn't a collaborative effort. He didn't sit down and say, all right, guys, the three of us, let's work out an outline. Let's kind of figure out what we're going to write. Uh, it is Paul who is writing this, but he included the people around him. He included those that he was sharing life with in terms of leading 
um, the, the ministry that was uh, under his authority as an apostle. Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. Typical opening of a letter, typical um, Greek structure of, like we would say, I, I wrote a letter for my mom the other day, and uh, I started out with the date, and then beneath it I wrote, to whom it may concern. I mean, it was just a typical letter to, uh, regarding some business she needed to take care of. And this is a typical opening, you know, more personal than to whom it may concern, obviously, but it's a normal way, a typical way that a Greek thinker would have opened a letter. And the substance of the letter begins in verse 2. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. I think it's important for us to focus upon that relationship that uh, led to continuous prayers for the people of Thessalonica. Now, this expression of we continually give thanks to God for you is in spite of significant prolonged trial in that city of Thessalonica. We see the story in Acts chapter 17. Paul had been um, arrested and beaten along with Silas in Philippi. He ends up leaving Philippi, goes through a couple of smaller cities, and arrives at Thessalonica. And the Bible says some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. So people are responding to the preaching of Paul. People are responding to the teaching of the gospel that Paul and Silas have brought to this, uh, this city, made up largely of Gentile individuals. Uh, a good number of Jewish people, but largely Gentiles. And uh, Paul's practice was to begin in the synagogue, always was. It was his practice to teach first to the people of Israel, and then when the message would be rejected, which is what typically happened, he took the message to, to uh, non-Jewish people. And it's interesting, in Thessalonica, uh, the results of his preaching is very quick. Some of the Jews were persuaded, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace. They formed a mob and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house, which was where Paul and Silas were staying in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. So the opposition rises in Thessalonica. The opposition to the preaching of the gospel intensifies. And Paul and Silas, they leave because of the threat of persecution, and they go to the next community, which is Berea. And you'll remember in the book of Acts, it says the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians because they searched the word daily to see if what Paul was saying was true. And then those rabble rousers in Thessalonica, they followed Paul and Silas to Berea. They followed them down the road because it wasn't enough just to run them out of their city. They wanted to run them out of the whole region. The, the persecution, the opposition was intense, and yet Paul writes to the Thessalonians with great fondness, great remembrance. Paul writes to the Thessalonians saying, we always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. Now, Paul recognized these people we would call the Thessalonians. He recognized them as family 28 times in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. In these two letters, 28 times he refers to them as brothers and sisters, my brothers, my family. Or he writes about an individual who is coming who is your brother. Make him welcome. Your sister, make her welcome. The church of Thessalonica was men and women of all different ages who faithfully followed Jesus. Now, another teaser for next week. When you hear the phrase, faithfully followed Jesus, think biblical practices. They not only heard the word, but they did what the word called them to do, and they did it together. The church of Thessalonica were men and women who faithfully followed Jesus together. That is a description of any and every healthy church. Healthy churches recognize that we are members of an authentic family. There is 
deep relationship within the context of a healthy church. One of the reasons why I see individuals in this community or any other community move from church to church to church to church, always looking for something else, church to church to church to church. The problem is they never understood the value of authentic family. They never understood the value of sharing life together, walking through life together, serving Jesus side by side together, the deep relationship that is a part of authentic family. Authentic family involves far more than friendship. Please know that. I have friends within the church. I, have, I am richly blessed with deep friendships that span decades now. But being a part of a church is not about hanging out with friends. Authentic family isn't about friendship. We're not a social organization, as in we're just out doing good things. And we're also not a you know, social club that we belong to, you know, where relationships are the priority. We are the people of God serving Jesus together, embracing those biblical practices. A couple of things I want to bring to your attention about healthy families. What do you think of when you hear the word family? When that word, you know, just pops up, what do you think of when you think of the word family? You may think about your children or your parents, or it may be your siblings or your grandparents or your grandchildren, or it could be aunts, uncles, cousins, but it could also be close friends or even neighbors because we use that word. We'll hear people say that these friends of mine are closer than family, that kind of an idea, that kind of an expression. We would be wise to define family as people that we love and who love us. At the core of family is a shared love, one for another. Gail Innes of Michigan State University uses six characteristics to describe authentic family. She writes, authentic families are, first of all, committed. They are committed to relationship. They place a high priority on shared relationships. That means building and guarding and maintaining the relationships we have one with another. Secondly, Gail Innes says, authentic families are appreciative. They consistently let one another know on a daily basis, if possible, that each member of the family is valued. Thirdly, and along that line, is they communicate. They talk with one another about issues, whether they be large, big, looming issues, or small, everyday challenges that people face. But they communicate one with another. Fourthly, they spend time together. And they are deliberate about planning the activities together. They include all the different voices, from the youngest to the oldest, about, you know, what do you want to do this weekend? What do you want to do when we go, you know, into downtown Fort Worth or whatever it may be? As we spend time together, what is it that you are interested in? I found this one interesting. Again, this is Gail Innes of Michigan State University, and she says the fifth indicator or characteristic of an authentic family is they embrace spiritual wellness. She writes, they believe in a greater power and they embrace their shared beliefs. Sixthly, they deal with crisis and stress well. They are able to diffuse and then cope with the difficulties that inevitably rise in any relationship, any family experience. And they're sensitive to how others in the family feel when things are stressful. Now, I agree with Gail Innes that these are descriptions of authentic family. But does the Bible agree? Does the Bible describe family that way? I think so as we continue to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Because Paul is telling us that there's this deep relationship between him and the people, a, a, a deep gratitude, a remembrance of what had happened in the past didn't change that. I would tell you that healthy families honor, value, and encourage one another. A home is a safe place. A home is a place where children come from whatever experiences they may have had out in the world, in the school or wherever they may be, and they know that when they come home, it's a safe place. They are embraced. They are cherished. They are valued. I have a grandson, Braden. He's 14 years old, and uh, it was my job Friday night. We went down to Colleen. Actually, we went to Temple 
because my daughter and son-in-law, Laron and Amanda Slay, uh, they are both working in Temple now, and so they're selling their house in Colleen, and they're moving to a, a new home. Well, it's not new. It's a 100-year-old home in the old part of Temple, but it's new to them, and um, th- they're moving to that house. And so, you know, we're family. And so what does family do? We show up and we help. And so uh, I ended up going down Friday. Phyllis had been there a couple of days already because she's more family than I am. And so I, I went down Friday evening, and, and one of the jobs I had Friday as everyone was tired and getting ready to go to bed is I had to go pick up Braden from a band performance at uh, Temple High School. He's in the marching band. And so I went, you know, they said about 11, 11 11.15. I got there about 11.15. The game is still going on. Imagine how many penalties there must have been in that game at 11.15. But the band walks off the field. They walk across the parking lot. I wait for a while. I don't see any kids. I start calling Amanda. I said, where am I supposed to pick him up? And she says, you know, I'm not really sure because laurent has been the one who has picked him up. Why don't you go to the band hall and ask the band director? So I, you know... I walked into the band hall. I'm like the only parent in there. And I asked the band director, I'm looking for my grandson. Do you know where Braden Slay would be? And he, he said, yeah, he's over in that line there turning in his band uniform. And so I looked over there, and Braden sees me, but he's a little sheepish, you know. And so I leave. He doesn't come out very quickly. I go back in. It's pushing midnight now. I walk back in, and I'm just kind of looking for him. And, and he, he comes to me, and he rushes past me. Come on, I'm ready to go. And he rushes past me. And we get outside. Now, my, my grandson is um, on the autism spectrum. And so communicating emotions and things like that is not always very easy for him. So we get outside. I said, Braden, are you okay? Yeah, I'm great. I said, well, it doesn't look like you're okay. It seems like you're upset. No, I'm, I'm, I'm wonderful. I just had a great time on the field tonight. You know, I, I'm interpreting looks. I'm interpreting the flushed cheeks. I'm interpreting the obvious emotion as something different and but he clearly doesn't want to tell me what it is okay and so we get in the truck and we're driving a little bit and I start offering to get him something to eat and then all of a sudden he says okay I'll tell you poppy I'm poppy he said I'll tell you poppy um I wasn't putting my uniform up right and one of those band parents were yelling at me I said hey you know it's been a long day they're probably tired they're ready to go home you know it's okay buddy it's okay but you know In this area of um, healthy families honor, value, and encourage one another, uh, we just remind them that it's okay. It's all right. And you'll learn how to hang up that uniform. And then I said, did it bother you that I came in the band hall? Yes. Because what he, think about that. He's, He's feeling the stress from a band parent, and then he sees his poppy, Standing off to the side, he knows he's del- there's more angst, more anxiety. I created it. So I had to apologize to him. I had to say, Braden, I would never ma- want to make you feel bad. And, Dude, it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. That's what an authentic family does. Authentic family values the individual. Secondly, authentic families celebrate victories together. It focus not on the victory. We focus on the victor. It's not what was accomplished. It's who accomplished it? Years ago, I, I taught math in the Crowley School District in the elementary level, and I was um, working with a child who had a learning disability, and doing math was just overwhelmingly difficult for this little guy. And so we worked on various skills. We used various tools to help him to learn the skill of, of whatever the math that we were working on was. And towards the end, all of a sudden, he began to grasp it. He began to, to realize that he was learning it, and he did a math paper that that you got a hundred on. And he was so proud of that. And I took a big marker and I made it very clear, a hundred, great job, way to go. When his mother picked him up, he said, uh, or she said, Mr. Sharman, this is going to go on our refrigerator right in the middle of everything. She is telling her son, I knew you could do it. And even if he didn't, okay, even if he didn't, she was still going to affirm that boy because it's not a matter of what the boy did. It's a matter of who the boy is. Authentic family communicates that. We celebrate victories. When something happens in a good way, throw a party, have fun, celebrate what your children have done. And in the church setting, we do the same thing. When somebody experiences success, we celebrate it. When someone takes a step of faith, 
uh, you know, sticks their neck out a little bit to try something new for the kingdom of God and succeeds, we celebrate that. And we tell them, we knew you could because we believe in you. And thirdly, healthy families encourage one another through difficult times. I will always be a dad. I will always be a parent to my, my two kids. And I will always do my very best to encourage them through difficult times. But I have been so blessed that they married sensitive people who also encourage their spouses in difficult times. I've seen it on both ends. Landon with Kira, Kira with Landon, Amanda with Laron, Laron with Amanda. They encourage each other as they walk through difficulty. And we do that within the body of Christ. We encourage each other as we walk through the inevitable difficulties that are going to come into our lives. We remind one another that you're not walking through this alone. I am with you. I will stand with you always, and we will see you to the end. I want to share a story. You may be familiar with Team Hoyt. Bow season is only three weeks away, so when I hear the word Hoyt, I think of a Hoyt archery. But Team Hoyt is a father-son team. The father passed away just a few months ago. Team Hoyt was established in 1977. Rick Hoyt, who is himself profoundly disabled due to cerebral palsy, told his father that he wanted to participate in a 5K benefit run for a lacrosse player who had been paralyzed in an accident. Far from being a long-distance runner, Dick Hoyt agreed to push his son Rick in his wheelchair. And they finished all five miles, coming in next to last. That night, Rick told his father, Dad, when I'm running... Remember, he's being pushed in a wheelchair. He said, when I'm running, it feels like I'm not handicapped. That's all it took. That realization is what prompted Team Hoyt. That was the beginning of what would become well over 1,000 races completed together, which includes marathons, duelathons, triathlons, including six of the Ironman competitions where uh, the participant... Uh, swims a mile or two. I'm not really sure the distances. Laurie, you could probably tell me that, a mile or two. And then there's a, uh, a bike ride that might be 100 miles or more. I don't know. And then, because obviously I've never done that. And then the third one is uh, a full marathon that the participants run. Well, Rick, um, Rick and his father, Dick, have completed these. In order to do so, uh, Dick had to pull his son Rick in a boat with a bungee cord tied around his waist and attached to the front of that little boat for the swimming stage. So he swam the two miles pulling his son. For the biking stage, Rick rides a special two-seater bicycle, and um, his son sits kind of in a seat in the front, and so he pedals the weight of two human beings. And then for the running stage, Dick pushes Rick in a custom-made running chair as he makes that 26 miles. Dick and Rick also biked and ran across the United States in 1992 as a team, completing a full 3,735 miles in 45 days. Rick was once asked, this is the son, Rick was once asked if his father, or if he could give his father any one thing, what would it be? And Rick responded, the thing I'd most like to give my dad is the opportunity to sit in the chair just one time and I would push him instead of him pushing me. The 2009 Boston Marathon was officially Team Hoyt's 1,000th race. Why would he do that? Why would Dick Hoyt do that for his son? Because they're family. Because he loves his boy. And because his boy expressed a need, and the father said, I can meet that need. That's what authentic family is all about, us meeting the needs of one another, us serving alongside one another to minister to the, the needs and the cares of other people. We most naturally serve along people with whom we have relationship. Remember that. We most naturally serve alongside people with whom we have relationships. So it takes time to build those relationships. It takes intentionality. And secondly, you know, Paul said, we pray for you constantly. We are more likely to fervently pray for people with whom we have relationship. 
And there's a world around us that's hurting and struggling that are living outside of relationship. They just are. They may be surrounded by crowds, but they're completely alone. And we within the church family should never, ever, ever have an individual that that would be their testimony. That every person who calls this church home would say, it's home because I have a family there and I am included. But a word of warning, authentic family is a fragile reality. Authentic family is delicate and it is subject to the destructive forces of the world around us. In Acts chapter 6, the church is exploding, the church is growing, people are being reached. In Acts chapter 6, verse 1, it says, In those days, and those days is when the church is exploding and growing. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews, so the Jews of a Greek background, complained against the Hebraic Jews, which are Jewish people um, with a Jewish background, uh, because, of their, because their widows were being overlooked. The Greek widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. We see the first ethnic tension showing up in the church shortly after the church begins to explode. We see the first division taking root. We see the first opportunity to take offense towards other people. I just want to remind you that anytime we are in pursuit of authentic family, value it. Defend it, guard it, because there will be, I promise you, there will be opposition to the unity of the family. Let's take a look now at verse 3, because authentic family encourages shared responsibility. There's a reason why Paul said we always pray with thankful hearts. Verse 2, we always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. Verse 3, we remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. What is not said by Paul is every bit as important as what was said. You notice Paul doesn't write, boy, we are so thankful and we celebrate because you have put together a killer band for worship services. I mean, you have the best band in Macedonia. And he doesn't write, you have identified the most charismatic, most engaging speakers when you gather for worship. And he doesn't say, man, you have built state-of-the-art facilities, the finest facilities in the region. No wonder people are coming to your church. You got the fog machines, you got the lights, you got everything working. No, he doesn't say anything about that stuff. He talks about your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope. You know, good parents instill in their children an appreciation of shared responsibility. Lazy, self-absorbed children grow up to become lazy, self-absorbed adults. And churches can be filled with lazy, self-absorbed individuals who say, I'm here, what are you going to do for me? It's all about me. You know, I want a new program. I want you to do things the way I like them done. We can do that in the church. Beginning with simple tasks, we teach that responsibility to our children, don't we? And as our children grow and as they mature, they get new skills. The littlest children are told, you, you, you put your, your toys away every day. That's your chore. You clean your room. You put your toys away. Over time, they begin to feed and water the pets. Or maybe they unload the dishwasher after it's run the next morning. Or maybe, as one of my grandsons does, every day when he comes home from school, he makes lunch for himself and his siblings every day for the next day. Mom and dad don't make the lunch, he makes lunch. Or maybe it's mow the grass. Man, I mowed a lot of lawns as a kid that my mom and dad owned. And if I ever said, what do I get out of it? My mom would say, dinner. That's what you get out of it. You get dinner tonight. Maybe it's take trash to the street. Maybe it's doing personal laundry. Uh, I've watched one of my kids, their family, um, over the years, they share in the laundry duty. And I said, well, what does the youngest one do? She matches socks. She can do that. She can match the socks and put them together. That's her part of doing the laundry together. Because, you know, Paul was very specific about his gratitude. It's work produced by faith. Understand that as work 
that grows out of your personal faith in Christ, and everyone is engaged. Secondly, and it sounds the same, labor prompted by love, but the words are different. The first word, work, is a, it's the natural thing. It's just what comes easy. You know, what you, you just do because you enjoy it. Yes, it takes effort, but it's just no problem because you enjoy it. The second one is labor. Okay, it's hard work. Yes, but you do it because it, it's, uh, it's in response to genuine love, genuine love for Jesus. Listen, I didn't say this weekend, man, you know, I, I hope someone's moving this weekend. You know, because I don't want to go move dressers and refrigerators and washers and dryers. I want to I wanna go carry that stuff down hallways, you know, and through doorways. I didn't say that, but when my daughter said, hey, our, our closing got moved to Friday, it didn't take that long for me to say, I'll be there. No problem, because it's family, because there's love there and labor prompted by love within the kingdom of God. Do you love Jesus? I know you do. Well, we serve God in ways that it's challenging because we have love. And the third one was endurance. Endurance inspired by or fueled by a steadfast hope in Christ. We don't, it's not a one and done kind of thing. It's, it's, it's continuous until Jesus takes us home. We serve him out of a love for him and a love for his people, out of a faith placed in him because we know that God is at work through us. I'll remind you that everything done for Christ is in response to everything done by Christ. That's why in Romans chapter 12, uh, Paul the apostle wrote, I urge you, brothers and sisters, that family expression, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a co community, a singular living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Everything we do for Christ is in response to everything Christ has done for us. Not with an eye for a reward. You know, what do I get out of this? One of my grandsons on this move, you know, was helping a lot. He, he actually did a whole lot of stuff. And then we brought one more U-Haul to the house, you know, full of stuff, and we had to have it back to the U-Haul place by 3 o'clock. You know, it's, it's approaching 2, and uh, I'm saying, where's Braden? You know, he can be careful. Boy, I hate to throw him under the bus. I didn't mean to mention the name. But I, where's my grandson? Because, um, you know, there's, there's boxes he can be carrying out. And so I, I ended up calling his name, opened the door, said, you know, where are you? And he, he comes, and I said, come help. Come carry stuff. He says, oh, I guess three hours hasn't been enough. And I said, nope, it's not because we're not done. I'm still working, and I don't live here, okay? You live here, so you're going to keep on working until it's done. Because it's, it's immaturity, that's all it is. He's just a kid, okay? And we've got to remind him, no, you're family. You're part of this too. You can carry the light boxes, not asking you to carry the dresser. You can. His dad, my son-in-law, his dad has more pairs of shoes than any woman in this place. <laughs> Ready for this? And he stores, each, he stores each pair of shoes in their own little plastic see-through box with a lid on it. I can take my son-in-law, no problem at all. He thinks he's tough, but I got skills. All right, again, it's, it's not what can I get out of this. And, and we within the church, it's not what do I get out of this. The question we should be asking is how can I contribute? How can I be a part of this family? How can I serve alongside others? Because each member of an authentic family contributes. My question to you today is, are you? Are you contributing to the work of God through this family of believers? Maybe a better question would be, will you? Will you, beginning today, be a part of an authentic family, serving alongside brothers and sisters that you share relationship with? Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you so much for a family. And I have experienced family within the church uh, for decades. I thank you for the long, long friendships I have enjoyed. I want to thank you for the new friendships that are being established just almost every week with uh, new members of our family. And Lord, I pray that we collectively will never forget that we are 
part of a family. And to be authentic, it's a place that is safe. It's a place where people are valued. It's a place where people cooperate together. Lord, help us to guard our unity. Help us to press for unity as family. Help us to fight for unity in spite of all of our differences. In spite of the things that make us very unique individuals, remind us that we are brothers and sisters with a common father. And help us, Lord Jesus, to impact our community the way the Thessalonians impacted theirs. It's in your name we pray. Amen.